Hello everyone and welcome to the seventh part of the Q&A series in the context of the lecture series True Dhamma, following in the footsteps of the Buddha. As always with me is Saif and myself uh, Florian Lau and today we will continue where we left off last time. I think we have around uh, let's say 30 more questions uh, and we will see how long or how far we can make it today. And the first question is as follows and it has been asked quite a few times uh, by different people or implicitly asked. And many people want to know, should I go on retreats? What are possible benefits and possible problems? And are there differences for various levels of progress? Do you want to start or shall I? <laughs> uh, I guess I'll start. Sure. Perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, so retreats in general um, are obviously a good idea because seclusion is such an important part of the practice. Um, but you do have to before you go on retreat, you kind of have to know what exactly you're trying to achieve with the practice. And um, otherwise, you basically will go on retreat and you'll be doing random things. And maybe some things will work, maybe some things will not work. Other people will be telling you what to do or what not to do and so on. And you won't really make any progress in that way. So you kind of already have to be practicing and you want to have an idea of the sort of things you want to be achieving through retreat. And that's how you'll be able to use it effectively because um, like I just said seclusion is the main thing that you're going to be wanting to get out of retreat seclusion obviously in the sense of uh, secluded from distractions but also like physical seclusion so that's one thing you want to look out for because there, there are like retreat centers where you look at the schedule and you will be even if like for a few hours a day you'll be alone a lot of the other times you will be like around other people like either, you know, when you're eating, if you have to do chores or even like meditating with other people and so on. Um, and that's, if the goal is seclusion and it really should be, that's the best thing, you uh, be best practice you want to be doing during retreat. You want to be able to go to a retreat center or whatever, um, where you will, will be able to be secluded and where you'll be able to do your own practice. Um, a lot of the time they will kind of make you do their like their particular traditions, practice, and so on. So you do need to be careful about the retreat center and the schedule and so on. And it needs to be fitting in with your goals and where you want to get out of the retreat. Um, as for the differences for levels of progress, um, quite similarly to the what I've just been saying about seclusion, obviously, if you're quite developed already, one thing you could do as well is you could kind of bypass the whole sort of the tree center thing and just I don't know like go camping for for example like go to any like local mountains or or anything like that and just camp for a few nights by yourself and like yeah the added thing of enjoying the elements and being like properly physically secluded um, will be very good for developing the mental strength and so on and yeah that's pretty much it really mm -hmm. well, maybe one or two more additions if you just start out meditating, there are a few retreats that are suitable for that, that um, introduce you to the practice and give you an idea what you should strive for, what you should aim for and all those things. But as you cannot really tell right from wrong at that point, you should be very careful <laughs> what tradition you follow. So it's very easy to make a, yeah, to make a mistake there. It's a bit like when you just start exercising, you will get some results from whatever you do and that will give you false confidence in whatever you did. So you have to be very careful there not to yeah, attach yourself too much to a specific tradition or to a specific teacher because that can hinder your progress for a very long time. Yeah. And concerning the seclusion that Saif said, I obviously agree with everything I've said. Um, but it's also worth mentioning that you mainly aim for the mental seclusion. So if you go camping and get loads of books with you and uh, your smartphone and whatnot and use those those things for distractions then you are defying the purpose that's not the idea that you want to achieve you literally want to be bored you you want to overcome distraction you want to have nothing not even your meditation method you want to be perfectly secluded from all those things and then it's, it's an absolutely great practice and what you should really do i think the buddha even said in the dhammapada that there is nothing better for a for a noble disciple to refrain from what is endearing so 
that is what what a retreat should kind of aim at uh, in my opinion yeah absolutely uh, but yeah physical seclusion is also very important for that um so yeah you need to be physically secluded and mentally secluded yes. because <laughs> even if you try to be mentally secluded if you're having to like, just be in the presence of other people that is already a sort of form of um having to engage with the senses basically no. and that will keep you trapped from experiencing that true withdrawal no. maybe it's worth mentioning that the engagement with sensuality so to speak is always automatic it's always implicit you do it no matter if you want to or choose to or not it just happens and when you <laughs> well that's pretty much what, what upadana is uh, the assumption uh, in the five aggregates yeah. it's it's always there even if you don't actively do anything the, the mere yeah. presence of people will already <laughs> be a drawback so in that regard mm -hmm. many retreats are not so well suited for very advanced practitioners at least yeah. once you abandon self-view then you can like then you can like talk without it being necessarily a basis for increase of delusion but if you still have upadana and you're having to talk with people that will really be a basis for continued delusion like like you say automatically you mm. just have to be because you're completely within the realm of um already having self-view everything is just feeling that yeah so when you already have the right view as Saif just said then things change a little bit and you have a bit more wiggle room because then you actually can make a good judgment call of what is right and wrong but before that it's very difficult and you should be more careful than <laughs> than anything as the buddha said see the mm danger in the slightest fault and not just hand wave everything away and things will be all right <laughs> oh. yeah. yeah i think that answers that question <laughs> uh, let us maybe move to the next one and the next one is as follows another anonymous person wants to know are guided meditations useful it is much easier for me to meditate with guidance and uh, yeah i will take the first <laughs> uh, initiative on this one as a, as a super early beginner it can give you some guidance if you have no idea what to do but most of the time you should not be dependent on some voice that is chatting in the background and uh, that is telling you what to do you just make your, yourself dependent on on even more things uh, when you meditate at least be alone and have no noise and, and such things in the background if you meditate for self-improvement then that's fine then you can also do guided meditations but when you meditate for liberation <laughs> if that is your goal then you should be a bit more careful and learn to meditate with yourself because that is central engagement <laughs> and you want to get rid of that no yeah. um yeah there are those some sort of um, guided meditations like the ones you've been doing more recently which are more um dedicated towards rather than doing like this process, this method of meditation, it just basically guides you towards um, how to basically just abide in boredom and non-activity and to see the kinds of things you need to be looking for, like the fact that things arise from themselves. And that kind of more contemplative style, rather than like doing this method of watching your breath, just lightly guiding you towards seeing the right sort of things that can be sort of useful but it also depends very much um what you do once the guided meditation finishes like if the guided meditation finishes and you go back to distracting yourself then <laughs> it really hasn't done its job but if you hear like a down talk or something or one of those guided contemplations and it guides you towards the right things it gladdens your mind then you can just start abiding in that calm afterwards then that can be a useful starting point you know Mm. yeah as it's, it's always a bit difficult to, to judge because it obviously depends on the level of progress if you already know what to do then there is no need for any guided meditation if you are a very early practitioner and most people are technically even if they have meditated for, for a very long time they are not technically advanced in the sense that they have the right view so in that regard some guided meditations can be useful but most are not so that is also very important yeah the vast majority is just for pleasure for calm and for those things <laughs> yeah. and like we were saying before like same with the retreats like 
they have their own like traditions and methods and so on and they'll force you to do these sorts of things and they're not always good so you have to kind of be aware with that when you're doing guided meditations no that's that's a difficult topic it's I obviously upload some of them on YouTube to, in a sense, wean people off the, the methods that they have been doing for a very long time. But even then, I'm not quite sure if I'm achieving the purpose that I aim for with them. <laughs> Because I know some people who are just repeating them over and over again, even though I say explicitly, stop doing anything after a while. <laughs> and they, they don't yeah. do that. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that that's a good enough answer for that question. So let us move to the next one. Yeah. And this one is from an anonymous, anonymous person and that person wants to know how can I use self-inquiry skillfully to progress on the path? And this one is for you. Um, do you know if they're asking about the like specific, you know, the the Hindu Vedantic self-inquiry thing? Or is it like more of a general? I think it's more of a general. Question. Not so much specifically yeah. for a tradition, so just in general. I think I mentioned uh, certain questions that you can ask yourself. Uh, it, during the yeah. during the lecture, and I guess is, is that question refers to that, like yeah. And I was asking because there was another question which asked about self inquiry, which was the Hindu practice. Mm. But yeah, just like um, in general, like if you have of course some level of restraint, the reflection, like actually, like literally just thinking about things and um, seeing how it, um, like thinking about impermanence or not self and like concretely seeing how it applies to your experience is basically like the majority of what you're doing until the right view basically um, because like we've said before it's the right view um, Sotopana is about understanding so that sort of reflection after having been restrained the reflection can't be out of um, a purpose of avoiding pain and so on and distracting yourself The restraint needs to come first, obviously. But once that's done, yeah, you need to reflect and not merely think about it, not just be trapped in your thoughts. You have to see how it like completely applies to your experience. Um, but yeah, reflection is the main part of the path after that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It can. So you can just ask your partner about like, yeah, like, can I control my feelings? And then just sit with it, don't even answer it immediately. And you, you realize if you've been doing the restraint, like, no, you can't. And you just yeah, stay with it and think about it for a while. And then the clarity will emerge. That is exactly what I wanted to add. <laughs> Don't jump to an answer when you ask a question into your mind. You want to bring up a context of the question so that your mind starts looking. Mm -hmm. If you give the answer, then your mind is immediately done with the task. And then the question is <laughs> useless. The idea is to not answer questions and just let them endure in the mind and then really look. That is what most people do not do. They don't look in the present moment in their experience. They just glance over it and then it, it's gone. It has to be honest. <laughs> yeah. You don't want like an answer as in you don't want to ask the question and then like tell yourself what the answer is. You need to use the question to basically open yourself up to your actual experience. And then uh, you don't want to give an answer. You just want the experience to be clarified, basically. No, it's just to make and, yourself uh, sensitive to the to the things that there are to be discerned. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Anything else on that one? Oh, that's it, really, I think. No. Oh. <laughs> um, you can always like, um, read the suttas, obviously, and find things that the Buddha directly talked about to reflect upon. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they would even like, we've talked about it before, I think maybe, or the instructions are usually like very brief. But like we said, you can just ask yourself a very brief question the Buddha might give. Um, like, like I said, like, can you control your feelings and then just sit with it? Maybe like, for a whole day, you just sit in a Biden activity, ask that question and just sit with it. And yeah, the clarity will have to emerge at some point. No, yeah. that's actually exactly how I practice. As an example, I did not use the feelings. Uh, I, I, I used my intentions, and I was just sitting, abiding in non-activity, just doing nothing, and then asking myself, "Can I control my intentions? 
can I control my feelings? Can I control what my body do ne- uh, will do next? Uh, and all those things. And that can be very useful if you then really look. So if you have done the restraint and all those mm-hmm. things, then you will discover <laughs> and see. But without that uh, prior training, mm-hmm. it's very difficult. It's very much like you just you notice it. You just you don't give an answer on top of your experience. The experience just like uncovers itself, and you notice what's already there. Yeah, um, yeah. It's that's like, why you have to know the answer. Yeah. It's more like you suddenly discover it. You have to. You have created the context by asking the question. Then you kind of forget about it, and then your mind will randomly find things that are relevant to your question. And that is how you do it rightly, because in that way, there is not really greed and uh, aversion and delusion involved if you just randomly come to it. So there is no misconceiving through the three poisons. So in that way, it can be very helpful. Yeah. And that's why restraint is necessary at first, because if you haven't done restraint, then the mind will just incline towards automatically giving an answer. Because mm-hmm. it is painful to not have an answer and just enjoy that doubt. Especially, like we said, if you do it for a whole day, and your mind's shouting at you about the doubt and trying to give an answer for it. You have to be skilled or restrained to not just give in to that. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's actually quite useful now that I think about it. <laughs> you can really profit from those kinds of practice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's move to the next one then. And the next one is a question I get very often, and it's basically is teacher or tradition x any good and x is just a placeholder for any tradition people are asking about and that is a question that i get so many times and i personally don't really like to answer that i must admit i I don't want to talk down on on certain people specifically it's it's easier to talk down talk down on on books that are very old like the visudi maga i have no problem with that to pointing towards contradictions but i don't really want to talk down on a person (laughs) so if you want to ask such questions then please ask about something they say without directly referencing their name and then i have no problem answering them but if it's so obvious uh, i i don't want to engage in in any conflict so i can't really answer that so please just ask about the content (laughs) that makes it much easier for me to uh yeah to to answer the question properly then in that case, I don't have to think about all the, the possible outcomes. And yeah, it's not good to, as the Buddha put it, put a schism in any Sangha, really. I don't know what yeah. those people do in many cases. <laughs> maybe they are practicing good things and maybe they are also doing bad things or saying bad things. So it's always very difficult. <laughs> maybe you have something additionally to add. <clears throat> yeah. Um... I mean, if something was said before, but the the benchmark does have to be the suttas. So in that sense, you never really want to be a follower of any teacher or tradition, like except the Buddha. Like, um, like you know how the when you become a sotapanna and they have the things that sotapanna cannot do, and one of them is like take any teacher except from the Buddha. And that's not, it's not only in the sense of like, you know, you can't become like a Hindu or a Muslim or something. It also means like within Buddhism, you can't take any teacher. Like you can't take Sariputta as a teacher. You can't take Ajahn Chah as a teacher. You can only take the Buddha as a teacher because you've directly understood what the Buddha is talking about. And um, that's why like, if you're not, if you haven't got the right view yet, that needs to be the same mindset to reach that, that point. That's why the suttas are your benchmark and not specific teacher or tradition and so on. Obviously, teachers and traditions can be helpful in pointing you towards that way. But yeah, suttas are the ultimate benchmark. Really. Yeah, it's kind of dangerous to create an identity out of I, I am being a follower of the Goenka tradition. I am being a follower of the Mahasi Sayada. I am being a follower of X or Y or Z. It doesn't really matter. With the uh, with the right view comes the, the unshakable confidence in, in the Buddha, <laughs> exactly the Buddha and no other teacher. So then, you won't even consider anymore to <laughs> to take any other teacher. Sure, they can say very helpful things, but ultimately the suttas that is what you will be looking for. Yeah, as I've said. 
Ja. Ja, if any other tradition explicitly requires you to disregard this, then I would be very careful. So when they say that certain sutras must be omitted or such things, then uh, that's kind of a red flag for me, I, I must admit. So I would not I would not follow that such people even for initial advice. But yeah. Oh, anything else? Or well, let's move to the next one. Let's move to the next one. Okay. <laughs> Maybe there will be follow up questions. Who knows? Yeah. Another anonymous person wants to know, is there a good simile to understand dependent origination better? Uh, it's for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so in the Discord recently, we were talking about um, House of Cards as a simile for dependent origination, as in the top cards rely on the bottom cards to stand up. And if you take the bottom card out, then everything else falls apart. And uh, it is accurate in that sense. But the main thing that it misses for understanding dependent origination is that you can never see dependent origination from the outside in that way. You never see the whole house of cards. You never like step outside the five aggregates to see like there's the body, there's the perceptions, this is how it connects. You have to realize that you're you're within the house of cards. You're within the five aggregates. So when you're thinking about dependent origination, you have to realize that you can't see it from the outside perspective. So any simile that talks about dependent origination has to take that into mind, basically. You know, when you're trying to see the sights are dependent on the eye, for example, you have to realize that you can't you can't see the eye through your sights. You can only see it indirectly by just basically discerning that it's conditioned by something, by it's confined by something, it's within something. Um, so, you know, a good simile for that, it's, you know, it's not completely accurate, but like Plato's allegory of the cave is sort of accurate in that sense. Like if you don't know it, it's basically, and you can imagine some prisoners in a cave and they're chained up and they're forced to face a blank wall and behind the prisoners, there's a, like a fire and there's puppeteers putting stuff um, across the fire and there's putting shadows on the wall. And yeah, that's, the prisoners are only able to see the shadows on the wall and they, their eyes are fully focused on that. And yeah, that's it's accurate because our experience is basically fully focused on what's in front of us, on the senses and so on. And in sensuality, craving, it's always particular things that you're absorbed in. Um, and you realize that if you want to see behind you, you if you want to see what's conditioned by, um, you have to be able to like basically see the shadows because you are stuck in the chains, you are forced to see the wall. So without trying to actually look behind you, you have to realize basically that the shadows are shadows without trying to look away from it. So you have to basically um, withdraw from being absorbed in the shadows through withdrawal from craving. And then without trying to look away from it, without trying to like try to see the eye, you just have to see basically the sights are something that's impermanent, that's conditioned, it's within the eye. Same with the body, for example, like whether you see this or that, you don't try to look at the body you basically just see that whatever I'm seeing, it's on the basis of the body. And that's the, the thing we've been talking about, like Yonisoma and Sakara, it's all about the, the womb attention, the indirect attention. So yeah, the Plato's allegory of the cave, if you see that the, you are focused, you are within the cave, and you're focused right in front of you. And really, like, that's your situation. And you have to see basically what's behind you, what's conditioning those shadows without being able to look at it directly. So I don't know if that's fully helpful, but you have to realize that's the way you have to attend to your experience. You can't see it from the outside. Yeah. That's actually very helpful. <laughs> I could maybe just add one more example from the suttas. Um, there were some similes given. Um, I think uh, an elder bhikkhu named Nandaka 
gave a few similes uh, as he was instructing a large group of bhikkhunis. And he, for example, used uh, examples like a tree that has roots, that has a stem, that has branches, and that has leaves, and that also has a shadow. So the shadow is in a completely different domain from the outside, so it's not really part of the tree, yet it is com completely determined by the tree. If you remove the roots of the tree, the, the shadow cannot remain standing, as an example. So the tree will fall over and then everything else falls away with it. And this is kind of the same principle that we are trying to trying to explain, really. We want to remove the sense of self, which is kind of like the shadow, <laughs> and we remove it by removing the roots of the tree, which is, for example, like the body, or like the feelings, or like any other sankhara that is the condition, or is a necessary condition for the self, or for the sense of self, or whatever. So that is, might be also a useful way of thinking about it. There are other similes that are, I think, in the mm -hmm. same sutta, <laughs> so you can look that up. I don't know the number, sadly, but I think it's somewhere in the lecture. No. Yeah. The only thing is, like, the hard thing with the similes is obviously it's there's a tendency to just conceive it and just make like a mental model of it and just like think there's the tree and there's the shadow and that's what my experience is like. You have, you have to factually see that like my experience is the shadow and it is being determined. It's confined within the tree. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if you see it properly, it's not going to be like the mental model. It's going to feel confining on the level of you know, like literally feeling it like you're within a coffin basically like your entire life is within this fathom long body whether far near or sublime or inferior wherever it is it's within it and it's impermanent and it's subject to cessation so yeah, yeah. that's basically it that's also the interesting part about the the way the buddha taught basically everything he said is pointing towards this principle when he talks about uprooting something, then he's literally talking about this kind of attention. He's not jokingly talking about uprooting suffering. He literally says you must remove the roots of the suffering, not the suffering. And this is the, the, the scheme is all over the suttas, everywhere. And people don't, don't see it usually. They focus on other aspects, sadly, because this is the one that is important. <laughs> no. I mean, it is very subtle. It's hard to see. You know, that's why it's like when you become a sotapan, it's the, the opening of the Dhamma eye. Like you're now able to see what you won't be able to see before. Mm. Then um, it will be the most obvious thing, but before it was absolutely invisible. <laughs> yeah, completely, utterly invisible. Yeah. That's why it's really hard to understand. But yeah, it's all about indirectly knowing the background. You can never directly see it. Because if you directly see it, now something else is the background. I think one more simile might be good that the Buddha also gave. He was talking about a cook and a king, and the cook was preparing dishes for the king, and the king was only giving very indirect feedback, what he liked. So the cook had to observe the king and see of what dish he was taking more and of what dish less, so that he would well, be able to remain alive because he was cooking good food for the king. So he was kind of inferring from the behavior of everything that he could see what the the likings of the king must be but that is again more of a background knowledge thing and not so much a, a thing that you can directly attend to if you ask the king then he will have you executed because you should know you're his cook <laughs> yeah. that might be helpful and the king is basically it's like your own mind um it's giving you clues and signs so that's why like restraint from craving um, is giving you a clue into dependent origination. It is giving you the signs of your mind, the signs of the background. Because yeah, when you're seeing craving, you're seeing your intentions. And they're always in the background. Mm -hmm. That's why development of restraint of craving is the condition for seeing dependent origination. Yep. Like we were saying before, if you're too absorbed in the shadows on the wall, you're never going to be able to see what's been conditioned by. So you do have to step back. Um, and then you're able to see. So mm -hmm. unless you have the restraint of craving, you're just, you are going to conceive it and just think about it and not actually see it in your experience. No. Restraint reveals your intentions, so to speak, of greed, aversion, and delusion, because they will be there screaming in your mind, wanting to go out into the central domain or wanting you to go out. And by not doing that, you see, oh, those, those two things are different. <laughs> 
Oh, that was a very detailed answer for that question, but it's a very important question. So <laughs> maybe yeah. it helps. The people. most important, and also the most solvable as well. So yeah. Yeah. a good sim is hard, but hopefully some of that was helpful. Yeah. Every simile will only get you so far, but maybe it points towards the right direction. <laughs> Let us, let us just move on to the next question. I think we have about 10 more minutes. And this one is a bit longer. Uh, an, an anonymous person wants to know, I realize that I don't know what experiential aspect I designated with the word feeling, and it shocked me. After that, I watched uh, chapter six of the lecture again, and it clicked as uh, you compared the body to a sack of beans. I saw my mind and my body just happening and saw feelings, etc., as not mine. I assume this perception maintained will shatter ignorance. Is this anatta? Uh, well, sounds like it <laughs> at first glance, but it's always uh, a bit hard to tell because uh, obviously your experience is your experience. So it's a bit hard to, to answer such questions. Uh, the first thing, the, the shock is, is actually a very good thing because you realize, okay, there, there was something that I took for granted that was completely not how I thought it was. And that's always a good sign because a lot of the training until stream entry is about undoing your wrong views, undoing your wrong assumptions. And that should be shocking. If you overlooked something this obvious that you have no idea what you designated with feelings, then no, it's, it's very good. And the perception that, that arose on account of that sounds pretty accurate. The question is, does, does it stay like that or does it go into hibernation again? The, the mode of perception it should stay <laughs> only when it stays uh, then uh, does it, it then then it's a real let, let's call it the real sort of party pretty much before that it's it can flicker and come and go on its own and all those things and there's more work to be done but it's a very good milestone let's put it like that no well, anything you want to add <laughs> I mean, yeah to make it like it just relating to what we talked about with dependent origination if it is flickering in order to make it stay, you have to attend to that, um, like seeing the body just happening by itself, but place that as the context, the background of your experience and see everything else as determined by that. Um, and that's how it's, that perception is what's going to share ignorance because uh, yeah, once that's been developed, then there won't be anything you'll be able to do without the knowledge being simultaneously there it's based on this completely impermanent body that I've seen as impermanent. And yeah, otherwise it's easy to just be stuck in the foreground and yeah, you see the body's impermanent, you see perceptions are impermanent. But there's always going to be some background phenomena, more subtle phenomena, like consciousness, for example, that's going to stay as something that you're owning until you, you really develop that perception of um, something in the background that's impermanent is determining my experience and then that's how you can give all of basically yeah. even consciousness which is very subtle <laughs> well, mm -hmm. many of the uh, aspects that you have to also include are so subtle that you need a very good very good levels of restraint to see that and mm -hmm. i think we talked about that last time too that is really the point where you should start if, if you haven't already to restrain your impulse to distract yourself yeah. This will really help to unravel the parts that are still tied like a like a spider web. I think the Buddha compared that and made that comparison. <laughs> and then you can actually yeah. shatter that for good. Oh. Yeah. Because you can actually, the Buddha talks about like, Tujana can actually see the body as impermanent and give it up. But consciousness, they've owned that for so long and it's so subtle that they'll just keep owning that forever until they see dependent origination properly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. I think uh, we can move to the next question. Okay, so I always keep focusing and sometimes just forget myself and can't do anything about it. How can I not forget myself? Mindfulness is about non-forgetfulness, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I forgot. Uh, is it you or your or my question? Um. Oh, I think it's my question. Then feel free. <laughs> um, I'm assuming it's talking about um, like focusing on the breath during like meditation, for example. 
um, and it's relaying mindfulness to that non-forgetfulness about the breath, for example. Um, yeah, it's it's true that mindfulness is about non-forgetfulness, but it has to be non-forgetfulness about the correct things. You can practice non-forgetfulness about anything really, like um, you know that I need to do this thing tomorrow. I need to do my chores. Like non-forgetfulness can be about anything, but the mindfulness that the Buddha was talking about is obviously non-forgetfulness of your intentions mainly. That's the, the main thing at the beginning. So you need to be non-forgetful about intentions of greed, aversion, or distraction. And in that sense, it's not really about non-forgetfulness of the breath. Because yeah, if you're doing a meditation that's focusing on the breath, you know, you can't sustain that forever. Really. You know, I mean, even at some point, even if you do it for an hour a day, you're going to have to leave that state and return to something else. And then your forgetfulness will just come back in at that point. So instead, you want to basically be focusing on non-forgetfulness of your intentions. And because, non, like we said before, intentions are always in the background. Um, just being mindful of your intentions gives basically a broad context for your non-forgetfulness. Uh, which can be sustained then for your entire day. It's not something where you just focus on one thing and um, you need to really put energy to it. Having that broad context is uh, something that can be sustained much more. Um, but even then, yeah, like when you're practicing at the beginning, you are just going to be forgetful. That's, that's going to happen. So you just need to be patient about it and keep developing it and um, also be more percipient about the dangers by reading the suttas and contemplating it because uh, the, the thing that's going to make you not forgetful is seeing the dangers in the slightest form and seeing um, not just like fabricating the dangers but like actually seeing it as a, a dark poison a boil and so on um, and then it'll be impossible to not be mindful yeah, yeah. but it, that takes patience it takes a while you could think about being in a forest and you have to go across some paths and you know there are all kinds of deadly snakes. You will watch your very step if you know that it's very dangerous there. You will jump at the slightest <laughs> uh, sign of, of snakes, like deadly vipers or something. And this is what it is like to properly see the danger as an example. And that can really help. You will not lose your mindfulness if it is about a dangerous thing. <laughs> So yeah, in general, not so much focusing, rather more the more the background. And in that sense, yeah. so I've pretty much talked about the practice of virtue. And the practice of virtue is all about making your intentions visible so that your mindfulness automatically warns you when you move down the wrong path. It's not really something you have to actively do. It's It arises <laughs> as soon as yeah, you're about to do something. It's, al it's always you that pulls the trigger on forgetting in, in the end that goes with uh, the greed goes with the hate and with the distraction so it's not it's not something that just happens so to speak it always requires you to take the invitation that, that your mind <laughs> sends you so to speak oh. Oh, i think that's it about about it for that question or do you have anything else in mind um yeah i guess we can just say again that like you said it's, it's less about focusing more about the context like the more wider your context is the more imperturbable it becomes basically mm -hmm. and then it leads less less sustaining mm -hmm. um, i don't know if we've talked about it before like even like when you forget like that will be included within the context and then it's not really forgetting anymore. So, mm. and it's the same as the dependent origination stuff. Like if you're contemplating like the body as the background and it doesn't matter what you do, you know, you go to work, talking to people, not talking to people, wherever it is, the knowledge there is present, that the body is there mm. and it becomes so imperturbable because it's, the background is always there, whatever you're doing. Um, so it's, it's very much the opposite of focusing. <clears throat> yeah, focusing always takes energy. 
sustaining and it's, it's always going to be finite mm -hmm. um, now that i think about it could you say a few things about intentions i think that might be a very vague idea and concept for most people nowadays so that they don't immediately know what it is what what they have to look for <laughs> so we use many mm. words for that but <laughs> yeah. i mean the main thing is um, you just want to be focusing on why you want to do something so the main thing you want to look for is not it's not about the particular thing you're doing mm. it's about the simultaneously present reason for doing it so Sometimes you can, um, for example, you might want to eat food and sometimes you might have, uh, like it'll be the same piece of food. It'll be a cake, for example, but sometimes you'll have the intention, the reason to do it is just for the pleasure of it. And sometimes you might, it might be the only food you have and the intention is purely for just for the sustenance of the body. It's not to do with the craving. And you realize either way, it's the same action, it's the same object, or it's the reason why you do it. It's the intention behind it, which is simultaneously there, um, which determines basically why it's wholesome or unwholesome. And yeah, like, because it's the simultaneously present thing, it's, it's in the background. That's why like seeing your intentions is the beginning of seeing the dependent origination. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, all you need to do basically is just ask yourself why are you doing it? And you don't want to give fluffy answers, like broad answers, like, you know, I'm doing this thing because I want to help humanity or something. You want to be concrete. Is it out of greed? Are you just doing it because you want pleasure? Are you doing it because you want to avoid pain? Or are you doing it to distract yourself? Those are basically the three intentions, the three reasons you can be doing any action. And yeah. After a while, you'll even stop like caring about the particular things that are going on. All you'll be perceiving of is just your intentions. Because it doesn't matter what's happening around you, like whether this person is saying bad thing to you or whether this person is saying bad thing to you. It doesn't matter about what they're saying either. All that matters is that you have no intention of aversion towards it. And yeah, you stop seeing the particular things and you just see the background only, intentions. No. And maybe one more remark about that. It's not really that you have to intensely focus on your intentions or anything like that. You don't have to do it all the time and have to be constantly not, not missing a single instance. The thing is, they will reveal themselves when they kind of change. So that's maybe a good way of thinking about it. So when the situation changes and there is a shift in, 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 in intention that is also simul simultaneously there, then you are uh, I, I guess your mindfulness will alarm you if you have trained yourself sufficiently. It will just, just be there as a knowledge that, oh, I'm doing this out of grade, I should not do that, as an example. Yeah. And that is sustainable in the sense it, it's not a doing. It does not require the, the... Initially it requires effort, but after a while it's automatic. That's why it's even possible to, <laughs> to reach liberation in a sense because of the yeah, feasibility of the task. Oh. Anything else? That one? <laughs> um, no, I think that's it, really. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Then let's move to the next one. And this one is from an anonymous person. And that person wants to know it seems that all Arahants are mindful all the time, but do they even sleep? After all, the Buddha did criticize sleep a lot. The Buddha did not. <laughs> well, the Buddha did did criticize too much sleep let's put it like that uh yeah. it's it's he criticized indulgement in sleep he was sleeping like like any other monk was sleeping there are many cases in the suttas where uh, he talks about sleeping and he always laid down in the lion's posture intent on wakefulness and then he rested his body as an example so he did sleep it was not as much sleep as most people uh, use nowadays but still <laughs> sleep is sleep and arahans well, are mindful all the time that is true obviously um but it's not so much about well technically during their sleep they are also well they are conscious but they are not aware maybe that's a problem is there, is there mindfulness 
well if there is no I mean, it's, uh, it's quite it's closely related to the last question actually it's a good way of linking it because the Buddha talking about sleep often he would say like he goes to sleep with the like intention and mindfulness of when he's going to wake up and that he's not going to indulge in lying down and oversleeping and so on and you realize yeah that's that's the mindfulness he talks about because yeah he, he establishes a context and that he's going to sleep within that context so that when he sleeps then the context is still there that's why when he wake up wakes up the context of not overindulging is immediately present to them so even then when they go to sleep the mindfulness is still there because the context has been established prior and it's not about like, he doesn't go to sleep and he's like always thinking about i'm going to wake up at this time no he just establishes context and then context stays the same while he sleeps that's the mindfulness right no you just nudge your mind into the right direction you give it a background task that will just run and upon awaking you open your eyes and there is a mindfulness again it's as if it had as if it has never left that's maybe a good way of putting yeah. it if you trained your mind well then it's like an obedient dog that does exactly what you say <laughs> if you did not train it well then it will be all over the place and you will be dragged around here and there and yeah and then you can indulge in sleep which is not good well, yeah. so sleep wisely that's maybe a good way of putting it <laughs> yeah. oh. and the main thing is that you can only really practice like when you're awake so if you sleep too much then well, you're probably gonna be doing out of laziness and aversion to effort and so on but also like you're not having enough time to actually develop the clarity of the experience that's why the Buddha talks about being dedicated towards wakefulness so you have that spending that persistence and time in developing clarity towards your experience because yeah you can only do it while you're awake yep and it is work kind of <laughs> and you can only work when you're awake so he did not talk about striving and effort uh, for no reason it is difficult <laughs> oh yeah. I think that's enough for that question. Let us move to the next one. And this one is from Karel Zauxi. And she wants to know, I thought after enlightenment, we escaped from our past karma choices, even in this human lifetime. I don't understand your story time about the chief disciple of the Buddha, Mogalana, because he was an instigator. Can you explain more how it is possible that uh, Mogalana met such a, such a fate that he was pretty much assassinated and killed? And uh, yeah, even though he was an arahant. And I think this one is for you again. Yeah. Uh, the main thing to realize is that you escape the karma through disowning it, not through like getting rid of the karma. So, like, if you do bad actions in the past, those bad actions are going to stay with you. And so, like, if I say hurtful things to somebody, no matter how much like I develop virtue and so on. That person is still probably going to think badly of me and i may in the future that karma may ripen and they may do something badly to me but if i develop myself and i disown the karma disown the taking up of self then that karma might ripen but it's not ripening for me anymore and that means there is there is no self in regards to it there is no craving in regards to it and so there's no suffering in regards to it either and that's the main thing you gotta realize that's that's why we're trying to escape the karma is escaping the suffering of it not that those things don't happen no yeah. i think the buddha said that we escape the burden of karma not so much the, the karma itself <laughs> we are no longer weighted down by it we are just free when we put down the burden and then no, we cannot suffer anymore so that is the main point again it's all about suffering and how to overcome it and not so about uh, not so much about karma there were, for example, uh, rivaling ascetics or sects at the, at the time of the Buddha that were teaching the er eradication or cancelling out of Kama. And the Buddha criticized them very much because it is not possible. <laughs> and he ridiculed them in, in many different ways because yeah, they tried to do something <laughs> that is a very vague thing. And yeah, I think out of all the eight different reasons for current bad feelings as an example only one was past karma when the buddha laid those things out so whenever those people tortured themselves 
uh, to count, uh, cancel out their, their past karma, then they were actually just yeah, doing ridiculous stunts and rituals and not really doing anything helpful for their liberation of mind. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> or should we move on? I mean, the, even though you can't escape from the karma in that sense, as in those things will still ripen, um, the entirety of the actual practice you're doing is still within your control. It's never going to be like the, the karma is going to make it so you can't practice necessarily, at least in our time. Um, you know, it's all within your control, it doesn't matter. Like in the sutras, um, I forgot his name, but the the bandit who murdered like so many people. Angulimala. Still, even, yeah, yeah. Even with all that bad karma, he still was able to practice and gain aronship and escape that karma in the sense that he didn't suffer from it anymore. But yeah, him as well, he had to uh, face up to the consequences of it. Yeah. People were hurting him with sticks and stones all the time. And I would not be surprised if he was just killed by, by people. I don't think there is any account of his death, but <laughs> it's very likely that someone uh, who had a grudge against him because he killed some relative or acquaintance of those people just killed him. But he would not suffer from that. <laughs> That's also very important. Uh, and the Buddha even said, bear it, Angulimala, bear it, Angulimala. <laughs> it is much better. It's a, it's a much better fate than what you would have, what, uh, what would have awaited you otherwise. <laughs> I think that's enough on that question. Let us move to the next one. And this one is from an anonymous person. And that person wants to know, I remember from the beginning of the lecture, your definition, uh, you defined the word Dhamma as nature of things pretty much. Well, in my country, Dhamma is identified as the Buddha lectures. Which of those is a good definition? This one, was it for me now or for you? I, I forgot again. Um, it was my question. Perfect. I believe. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there's, um, I think you want to see the main definition as nature, because that's the, the definition that's going to actually be useful for contemplation to understand the Dhamma. But yeah, even the suttas, like, um, they would use the word Dhamma in terms of teaching, like this, this discipline, this teacher Dhamma, for example. Um, well, yeah. It, Anyone's Dhamma, it's always going to be their teaching about the nature of things, about the universal nature of things. So that's that's the main definition. And yeah, it's actually it's a useful contemplation because you know all these things we've been talking about, about not being absorbed in particularity, about seeing the background. It's always about seeing the universal nature of things. Like we were just saying before, it doesn't matter what happens to you, if you're just aware of your intention, that's already at the level of being absorbed of particularity and starting to see the universal nature and yeah, broaden the context until you reach the basically the most the highest form of knowledge of the nature of things, which is the Sotapanna's knowledge. Everything that arises is subject to cessation. That's the universal nature of things. That's the Dhamma, basically. So yeah, it's a good thing to contemplate in that sense. Yeah. Oh. It's also like it, it shows you exactly the why it's less about focusing because focusing is always about the particular thing that you're focusing on, you know. Whereas the context, the Dharma, it's always about the universal nature of things, the broadest possible, broadest possible point of view. Yeah. Just an interesting remark, maybe. The people at the time of the Buddha called their, their teachings their Dhammas. The, the nature of things, how they see the nature of things. And I think that is a trend that also was very present in ancient Greece, as an example. There are lots of documents where they just call their uh, oftentimes poems on the nature of things. <laughs> There's everywhere. So people always try to answer yeah. that question. It's it's what moves humanity, pretty much. <laughs> But you will know a lot more. Like, yeah, yeah, so like It's very much like you basically read all the ancient philosophers and yeah, knowledge is about the universal. That's what it was always about. Um, it's only like modern philosophy is kind of starting to move away from that in quite a lot of ways. But yeah, always it's about the universal nature of things and different philosophers have different views on it. But it's only the Buddha that gives the, the true universal nature of things, at least to the extent necessary to disown everything and release yourself from suffering. 
No. So yeah, that's another good thing to think about is that the universal nature that we're talking about is it's only the extent necessary to escape suffering. Mm. You can fabricate so many different ideas about the universal nature of things. No. Science does the same thing. We are also generalizing, abstracting, trying to find more general things all the time. Yeah. yeah. But at the core of all of it, there is a fundamental problem, namely the assumption of ob objectivity that uh, leads to problems there. That's why science cannot lead to personal freedom from suffering as it deals with objectivity and not so much with subjectivity. And Buddhism or Dhamma practice is all about subjectivity. Yeah, again, another very detailed answer. Let's move to the next question. Yeah. This one is from an anonymous person. And the person wants to know, I live in a country with many insects that trans transmit diseases. I try to carry them outside and keep the precepts, but I am afraid that I act out of hate or greed. Also, when they are outside, they can harm, uh, do harm to others. What is the right way to act? Well, uh, we have answered uh, along those lines many times. It is all about your intentions. This is why it's so important to make those intentions visible. Otherwise, you cannot really tell uh, why you do something and if that is wholesome, as in leading to liberation, or unwholesome, as in leading away from liberation. And this is not a very nice state to be in, which is why people are full of doubt, because they don't know if what they do is good. They don't know if what they do is bad. So you kind of need to take that as an inspiration to press on and try to understand your, your intentions better to actually do those things that are good for you and avoid those things that are bad for you. So in this case, it's probably a good idea not to break the precepts, namely killing insects even. Uh, but you also have to understand that it's not, ab not about following those rules blindly, mechanically. It is only an enabler to understand your intentions better. It's the first step toward revealing the intentions you are acting out of. And even if, they, if the insects can do harm to others, I mean, they multiply like crazy if you kill one bug then another one will just take its place so that's not a, not an encouragement to kill by the way not at all <laughs> it's just to uh, take that doubt away maybe <laughs> yeah anything you want to add um yeah so acting of here agreed with regards to taking out insects and so on. It can be a bit of a sort of thing to see, I think, especially like a more overarching fear of fear of your life, for example, and that sort of thing. Um, so you've got to realize as well, it's it's not only about what you do in that specific situation, but also like beforehand, what you've been, how you've been living your life. Because if you've been engaging with sensuality all the time throughout your day and distraction, it doesn't matter how mindful you are during that moment when you see that insect. Because you've been acting in a way that attaches yourself to your experience, like all the thoughts of hate or greed and fear of life, fear of your health and so on, they're just they're going to assault you. Um, so you do have to be thinking about the entire domain of craving and reducing that. And like you, like you talked about intentions, your intentions will become more, um, they'll be easily seen than because you've been taking it on that universal level and not just during this particular moment. Yeah. yeah. Dhamma practice is about preparation much more than about how to behave in a specific situation. Maybe that's a good way of phrasing it. Mm -hmm. By weakening your craving, you prepare yourself for all situations at once. For example, if you have yeah. been very fearful all the time that people might I don't know, mug you in the streets and practice a lot of Dhamma and weaken your craving, then you can suddenly go through the streets without fear. <laughs> you prepared yourself. It's not that you act very skillfully when you are mugged. It's just, yeah, the fear is gone. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's move to the next question. This one is again from an anonymous person and that person wants to know, I have many responsibilities and barely any alone time in my job. Are uh, normal retreats good for me, or should I rather do a solo retreat somewhere secluded? Well, we kind of answered that, I guess, but you can maybe summarize it in short so that we <laughs> give a satisfying answer to that person. Yeah, I mean, the any retreat, basically, where you're able to be fully secluded, 
you find if you're able to find a normal retreat where you can do your own thing that's good otherwise you know run our cabin or go camping or do whatever solo retreat you can because yeah if you have many responsibilities um the seclusion is going to be necessary for you but if you go to seclusion but you're still like talking to people or even just being around people it is on the same level as having respond lots of responsibilities it's on the same level of having to engage and be bound to the world basically and so yeah you have to be secluded physically from other people that's very important so yeah, whatever opportunity you can to just be physically secluded that's what you should go for yeah that's very important the busier your life the more precious those opportunities are and you should grab every single one of them that you can and really put them to a good use mm. yeah like we're talking about the context like if you do like a strong retreat and you're secluded from that that becomes your context now that becomes your framework so then when you go back to responsibilities it's not a basis for delusion but if you have never tasted that withdrawal obviously that that could not become your context so yeah like you're saying it's precious time you need to establish yourself inside of it no yeah. during that engagement of yours it's very hard to make any progress so you have to make the progress while you can and then take it with you that is the idea behind it yeah and as yeah. always we refer to the question we answered before about retreats in general <laughs> that should answer that question too okay and let's move to the next one and here another person wants to know i have trouble seeing the world of the senses as unattractive is it okay to try and see it as boring instead is there an even better way on how to proceed uh, i guess it was for me uh, yeah the thing is you don't want to try to manufacture perceptions you want to reveal how the reality really is that is very important if you try to do something then there is already uh, greed or distraction or hatred involved and that will lead to you misconceiving things what you try to do as we have explained numerous times now is that you kind of want to create the context in which reality can reveal itself namely through restraint and through all the other things <laughs> things will just become apparent you kind of give your mind a background task and then it will do its thing and then you come to it and realize it instead of doing it that is this is the important part this was uh, in the last q a uh, a theme that we did a lot it's about non-doing <laughs> it's about discovering discerning all those things that's a much better way to approach things the world of the senses is unattractive but you will try to have may uh, you have to try and make sure to, to really discern that and not to manufacture that you can also try to see it as well meaningless it also has a has an aspect of that that there's no really lasting pleasure but i would not really call that boring that is also a feature of unattractive to be honest <laughs> if there's no lasting pleasure then that is unattractive because we are at the very core as unenlightened people seeking pleasure seeking permanent pleasure even oh. so that would be the better way to create a good context and then the nature will reveal itself yeah anything you want to add <clears throat> yeah the reason why um, seeing is boring uh, might be more useful than seeing as unattractive is because there's a tendency if you're trying to contemplate the senses the world of the sense is unattractive is that you try to see the unattractiveness in the objects which is the wrong way to go about it the reason why it's unattractive is because craving is unattractive um it's because like the the objects there are still beautiful objects in the world but because craving is unattractive those beautiful objects then become unattractive as a result and you realize that boring has more of a connection to your state of being boring has more of a connection with craving that's why it's um, if someone contemplates boring it might be more useful because you're seeing the nature of craving and not trying to see the organism in the objects um, but like Flo says, it's, it becomes even more um, apparent if you simply just restrain yourself and let it reveal itself. Because if you abide in boredom, work well, through the boredom, then the world of the senses will be seen as boring. 
because um, it's only because you're still attracted to it, you're still absorbed in it, you're still being controlled by it, um, is why you see it as uh, something attractive. When you've been withdrawn for a while, you know, it's just all the things in the world just arise and pass away and you see it directly because you're not absorbed in it. And um, then you see all of those things as boring because, yeah, no matter how much you go through it, it's going to be even more and even more and even more. Mm -hmm. So you do that by working through the boredom yourself first. Yeah. And maybe one more remark. Uh, a lot of people try to feel the world of the senses as unattractive or as repulsive, while well, you should actually try to perceive it or per perceive the sankaras as, as unattractive. So you kind of see that you try to, people always try to feel perceptions in a sense, while they should perceive percepts and uh, feel feelings. We kind of mix it up uh, as a basic problem as uh, people who have not trained a lot uh, in the Dhamma. So you want to notice how craving is unattractive, as, a, as a, in a sense, as, as I've said. You don't have to really feel it. That might also happen at some point. But in, as, a, as a first step, you develop the perception and not being overwhelmed by feelings of disgust all the time. Which could happen, but yeah. <laughs> no. Anything else? <laughs> um, no, I would just emphasize again that it's, it's it's dependent on how much you've been restrained. Like, if you're not restrained at all, like trying to see it as boring or unattractive, it can only go so far, because all your actions are obviously implicitly saying that you're attracted to it. Mm -hmm. There is no basis for seeing it as unattractive. No, only the restraint can reveal that. Yeah, uh, how much time do we have? About four or five minutes? Always can't read the number. <laughs> no more question. Okay, one more quick question. And this one is a rather often one that we got. Actually, that was yeah. because the phone's coming down. It's also a long one, probably. That question takes yeah, some time to okay. answer. <laughs> so yeah, in that sense, uh, I think it's a good point in time to uh, end this video. Thank you all very much for watching. If you have any remaining follow-up questions, feel free to let us know. But until then, I wish you a pleasant day and goodbye.